The word of life that God has permitted for us today comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 10 through 16. First Corinthians chapter 2, verses 10 through 16. And I will now read. Please follow along with your eyes. First Corinthians chapter 2, verses 10 through 16 says, For to us God revealed them through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, the thoughts of God no one knows except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, so that we may know the things freely given to us by God, which things we also speak not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the Spirit, combining spiritual thoughts with spiritual words. But a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. And he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. But he who is spiritual appraises all things. Yet he himself is appraised by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he will instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. And this is the word of God. Amen. Good afternoon. Today, based on 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 10 through 16, I'm going to be sharing with you a message entitled, What Kind of Person Am I? This is a very open-ended question. You could answer it any which way, right? But there is a specific answer that I'm looking for here. But before I get into the main uh, topic of today's message, I just want to share with you about the uh, missions trip that I took from Tuesday until Friday last week to the Dominican Republic. Um, We were in three cities, uh, a city called Moca, and then La Romana, and then Santo Domingo, which is the capital, in three different churches. We had three seminars, and it was really great and successful. Um, I want to give all praise and glory to God for what he's doing through uh, our church and through the word of redemptive history. Um, so we were introduced to the churches in um, the Dominican Republic through our sister Sandra. Her friend, whose name is Maria, opened up her home to us and just really just welcomed us into her home. She gave us her bed to sleep on. It was just amazing. Um, it wasn't obviously it wasn't like the best of conditions, but. The fact that we were able to bring the Word of God to the Dominican Republic really just blessed all of us who were there. And the people that were listening to the message really received the Word so well and with much passion. I think we all need to learn from, you know, them because we have it so easy here. And it's just, the Word is just always there, right? Right? And I think we take it for granted. But they were really passionate about receiving this word and thankful for it. Whereas for us, we just think, oh, it's just every Sunday, every Lord's Day, whatever, every Wednesday, I just go to church and it's just there, right? So maybe, I mean, if the chance comes, I would like to take some of you with me. It's not an easy journey, but I think we can learn a lot from it. Okay? So please continue to pray for our missions work, and spreading the word of redemptive history around the world, okay? So today, the title is, What Kind of Person Am I? The Bible tells us that, like, broadly speaking, there are two types of people in the world. In today's text, there is the spiritual person, and then there is the natural man or sometimes called the fleshly person, okay? So we could categorize broadly human beings into these two categories. There's the spiritual person, and then there's the fleshly or natural person. So what are the characteristics of these two types of people? 
And hopefully through today's message, we will see what kind of person we each are. And hopefully all of us will be in this category right here, right? Not here, not somewhere in the middle, but here. Okay, amen? Amen. Thank you. (laughs) So number one, let's talk about the natural man or the fleshly man. In today's text, it says that the things of God are appraised by the Spirit of God. Okay? But the natural man, it says, cannot accept the things of the Spirit of God because he doesn't believe in that. He or she doesn't believe in that. And I'm sure we may know people like this around us or maybe there is this, an inkling of this kind of person that's in us right now even. Okay? We cannot accept the spiritual world because it's invisible. It's not something that you could touch. It's not tangible. You can't eat it. You can't wear it. You can't do anything with it. Right? But the Bible clearly says that it exists, right? The natural man cannot understand the spiritual things of God. And our senior pastor, Reverend Abraham Park, spoke about this, and he says, the natural man is not at all interested in these things. He or she does not care about it doesn't even want want to think about it because it has nothing to do with them. And so if you are this type of a person, you cannot have faith. Because faith is based on the Spirit of God. Without the Spirit of God, we cannot have faith. So without a spiritual basis or foundation in our hearts, There is no way to build our faith on. So for example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 3, it says, No one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Okay? It is the the work of the Holy Spirit that enables us to believe in Jesus Christ and confess our faith in him. So a natural man then is driven by what he or she sees or can touch or can ingest and also by their instincts, okay? So if you look in the book of Jude, Jude is the last book before the book of Revelation. Chapter 1, verse 10, this is what it says about the fleshly or carnal people. It says, these men revile the things which they do not understand and the things which they know by instinct, like unreasoning animals, by these things they are destroyed. Okay? So since they cannot see or understand the spiritual world, they revile it. They say, oh, that doesn't exist. Don't even talk about that. And they are led by their instinct only. Okay? That's, the Bible calls that the fleshly thoughts. Okay? Even our flesh has thoughts, right? There are our appetites, our lusts, our desires, our instincts that drive us. And the fleshly person is led by these things. And the Bible says ultimately they will be destroyed by those things. That's really scary. Because it's so easy to just let ourselves go and let the instinct and the fleshly desires lead us. That's just very easy. Our natural inclination goes that way. That's why it's called the natural man. You just let yourself go, and that's the way you go. But in order to be a spiritual person, you have to go the opposite way. It takes a lot of effort. It's hard work. It's unnatural. It's like going against the stream, upstream, right, like a salmon. And that's why living a life of faith is difficult. And in comparing these two types of people, I want us to think about Jacob versus Esau. Okay, remember Jacob and Esau, right? They were twins. 
Esau was the older one, but they were very different. Okay. Jacob, his whole life, he was desiring the birthright, the blessings of the firstborn that God promised. That's all his thought was, you know, all about how am I going to get that birthright? Because that is the spiritual blessing that God promised. On the other hand, Esau really didn't care about that, even though he was born with it. So what did he do? One day he came in hungry, and Jacob was making some lentil stew, right? And Esau says, can I have some of that? Because I'm, I'm about to die of hunger. Have you, has anybody died of hunger like that? You skip one meal or two meals, do you, would you die of hunger like that? No, right? But anyways, he says, give me some of that because I'm about to die of hunger. And Jacob says, you know, this is my chance. What does he say? Sell me your birthright for this bowl of lentil stew. And he says, sure, why not? What good is this birthright? Doesn't, I can't eat it. Can't feed myself with it. Take it. It meant nothing to him. But for Jacob, it meant everything. See, see the cl clear difference between these two people? For this guy, the thing you could eat and touch and see, that's all that mattered for him. For Jacob, he had the thing that you could eat and touch and feel, but that didn't matter to him. For him, the most important thing was this invisible thing that you couldn't see or touch. The spiritual world and the spiritual blessings. So Jacob is the exemplary spiritual person and Esau is the exemplary natural or fleshly person. Now, we could break up the natural fleshly person into two other categories. So let's think about this. There is the natural fleshly person who completely denies the spiritual world, does not believe in God, is an unbeliever. But there could also be a believer who is a natural or fleshly person. And the Bible calls those kinds of people infants in Christ. Okay? The Bible calls them infants in Christ. So let's turn to, if you are in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, we're going to go to the next chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. Okay? First Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. And it says, And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual men, but as to men of flesh, as to infants in Christ, I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, for you are not yet able to receive it. Indeed, even now you are not yet able, for you are still fleshly. For since there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not fleshly and are you not walking like mere men? See, Paul calls these fleshly people infants in Christ. So, Infants in Christ means they're in Christ. They're believers. They're churchgoers, but they are yet still fleshly, he says. So because they're infants in Christ, Paul could only feed them milk and not solid food. Milk for babies who have no teeth, right? This is what Paul is saying. And to these kinds of people, even though they profess to believe in God, they are still led by their fleshly nature. And to them, the Bible says, the word of the cross is foolishness to them. Okay? That's what 1 Corinthians 1.18 says. And they say, oh, you know, you don't have to work so hard for the church. You don't have to go every week. You know, you could just be partly in the world and partly in Christ and just take it easy, right? And senior pastor said, these kinds of people cannot please God. Because in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, it says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. And their hearts, even though with their lips they may profess to believe in God, their hearts are going in the other direction. 
So in Hebrews chapter 5, verses 12 through 14, it also talks about infants in Christ opposed to mature Christians. And it says that mature Christians, because they could partake of solid food, it's talking about spiritual solid food here, that they, they have discernment. But the infants in Christ do not have discernment. And this is very important. We need to be able to discern as we live in this world what is right, what is wrong, what is the truth and what is not the truth, what is God's will and what is not. And these kinds of things come through training. And only those who have gone through the training and matured in the word can have this kind of discernment to be able to know, oh, in this situation, this is God's will. But in many times, it's very confusing to us, right? It's because we're still infants in Christ. So we need to partake of solid food. Not just the elementary principles in Christ, right? The elementary teachings. You know, faith and repentance, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But now we need to go a step further. And we need to see what God's will for us is. So for example, it's... This is too abstract, right? So let me give you an example of an infant in Christ as opposed to a mature person in Christ. An example of that would be Job versus his wife. Remember Job? He suffered greatly, right? God let Satan test him. And he suffered, he got sick, he lost all of his children, he lost all of his wealth. He became, I mean, overnight he lost everything. And the Bible says, through all this, Job did not sin, nor did he blame God. That's the kind of deep faith that Job had. That's what it says in Job chapter 1, verse 22. But how did his wife react? If you turn to Job chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, you see, we see two different reactions, the one from the wife and the one from Job himself. In verse 9, the wife says, do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. That's what she said. Very succinctly, she just went to the point, right? Curse God and die. I mean, if I were in your shoes, I would curse God and die. That's what she's saying. Because now Job is sick. He has rashes all over his body. He's like scraping himself with broken, you know, pots. And what does Job say? In verse 10, he said to her, You speak as one of the foolish women speaks. Shall we indeed accept good from God and not accept adversity? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. So, when you compare these two people, what's the difference? They both believed in God. The difference is this. When the adversity came, when the hardship came, their reaction was different. One of them said, curse God and die. Forget God, because all this came on you, you know, from God. Why would you still believe in him? But the other said, God is the one who gave us life and blessing and everything else that we had, all the good things. So then we have to accept the bad things that he gives us too as well. That is the person of true faith. God gives us both blessings and hardships and adversities. But Job says we must accept both. Now in Job's faith, What he understood is this, that through hardship and enduring the hardship, he believed that God was taking him to the next level of faith, and he trusted in God. That's why he was able to endure through it. But the infant in Christ cannot accept the hardships or the testings or the temptations that come along with partaking of solid food to become a mature Christian. So in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 8, it says that even Jesus learned obedience through suffering. Jesus, who is the Son of God, who is God himself, even he learned obedience through suffering. 
And in James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, this is what the Bible says. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. You see? The testing of your faith produces endurance, and endurance enables you to have complete and complete and perfect faith. Okay? And Job understood this. That's why he did not sin with his lips, nor did he blame God for what happened to him. But his wife, as we heard, said, curse God and die. And then there's another aspect of the fleshly infant Christian. So the first aspect of the infant Christian is that they are unable to withstand or endure the testing of faith, right? But the mature Christian is able to endure those things, okay? Another aspect of the infant Christian is this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 3, we, we read this, right? You are still fleshly, for since there is jealousy and strife among you. This is a, a characteristic of an infant Christian. That there is still jealousy and strife among them. So, this, I think the simple way to explain it is like this. The mature Christian prizes brotherly unity and love of Christ and the glory of God over personal vindication. Okay, let me just say that one more time. The mature Christian prizes brotherly unity, love of God, and glory to God over his or her personal vindication. So what does that mean? Let's say you get in an argument and you know you're right. But by just continuing to assert your rightness to vindicate yourself, you see that it may bring strife in the church. A mature Christian will back off and sacrifice his personal vindication so that the brotherly unity will not be damaged or the God's glory will not be damaged. But an infant Christian will seek their personal vindication no matter what the cost. Imagine if Jesus did this. Jesus, let's say Jesus is on the cross. He's, but I didn't do anything wrong. It's that guy's fault, that guy's fault, her fault, her fault, her fault. It's not my fault. Bring me down. Then where would we be today, right? So Jesus did not seek personal vindication, but he sought the will of God, which is his own suffering, right? That's the mark of a mature Christian. He or she is willing to sacrifice personal vindication for brotherly unity and love and the glory of God. So in other words, an infant Christian is selfish and childish, which we all are at times, even myself, and I am admitting this before all of you, okay? So finally then, what kind of a person is a spiritual man? Who is the spiritual man? There are so many things we could say it would take up too much time. But today I just want to emphasize a couple of points. A spiritual man is able to discern. He or she has discernment. This person knows what is God's will at each situation and they are willing to do it. They know what the truth is. They know where their place is. They know where their status and their calling lies. And they are willing to forego their personal satisfaction in order to do those things. In Philippians chapter two, verses three through five, it says, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, Regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourself, which was also in Christ Jesus. 
Amen, right? This is the heart of Jesus, that you do not do anything from selfishness, but humbly regard each other as more important than yourself. And look out for each other's interests, not just your own. That's the mark of a spiritual person. And finally, the last thing that I want to talk about today is that the spiritual man gives thanks in every situation. So let's turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18. Okay. Let's all turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 18 says this. In everything, give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Amen, right? So what, did, what does the Bible say? In everything, give thanks, because this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Amen. So how can we give thanks in everything? What if there's hardships? What if you're sick? What if your business goes bad? What if you don't get into the school you want? What if things go bad in your family? Can you give thanks in those situations too? But the Bible was saying that if you are a truly a spiritual person, you, are, you should be able to give thanks even in those kinds of situations. So I, I came up with three ways or three reasons why we should be able to give thanks in every situation. First is that by believing in God, we believe that all things ultimately work for our good. Because God is in control, we believe that all things will ultimately turn out for our good. This is what Romans chapter 8, verse 28 says. Okay? So I will read that for you. Romans chapter 8, verse 28 says, And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Amen, right? So what this is saying is that if we love God, we believe in God, then God will make everything work for our benefit. Even the bad things, the seemingly bad things, even the hardships, even the sufferings are all in the process of making everything good for us. Amen. That is what our faith should be. That's what we need to believe in. Okay? That's why we could give thanks for everything, everything in every situation. Because we know ultimately it's going to come around for our benefit. Right? And then number two, second reason why we could do this is because discipline is an expression of God's love. So discipline, like when you do something wrong, God chastises you or punishes you a little bit. That's discipline, right? And the Bible says discipline is God's expression of his love for you. Okay? Let's turn to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 6. If you have time, please go home and read the entire chapter 12 of Hebrews, which talks about all of this, about discipline, right? But let's just read Hebrews chapter 12, verse 6. It says, for those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, and he scourges every son whom he receives. See? 
It says that God disciplines those whom he loves. If you keep on reading, it'll say, if God does not discipline you, it says you are an illegitimate child. Okay? So if God is disciplining you, that means he has accepted you as his true son or daughter. Right? He scourges every son whom he receives. So this is proof. If God is disciplining you, he's bringing hardships in your life to test your faith, and that's proof that he loves you and that he has accepted you as his son. That's why we could give thanks in every situation. And number three, last reason is because we trust that God knows what is good for me more than myself or better, better or more. Anybody good in grammar? Is it more or better? Anyways, God knows. <laughs> God knows what's best for me, okay? So in other words, whatever he has brought into our lives right now, even though it may feel like a little bit painful or hard or distressful, he has brought it onto our lives because it is beneficial for us. It's like mom trying to feed you that really bad-tasting medicine got to eat it, got to take it. This is what God wants for us, and we got to accept it. So in other words, you are trusting God more than yourself. That is why we're able to give thanks. So these are, this is the true mark of a truly spiritual person, that you could give thanks in every situation. Thanksgiving, our senior pastor said, is the ultimate fruit of faith. To be able to give thanks in every situation is the ultimate fruit. That's the highest spiritual standard. It's because it's not easy. We could give thanks when things are going well, but to be able to give thanks in every situation is the most difficult thing. But that is the highest fruit and achievement that a spiritual person can uh, attain. So finally, I pray that all of us will be able to give thanks in everything. Amen? I would like for us to turn to Psalm 136, verses 1 through 3. Let's all read that together, and we will end today's message. Psalm 136, verses 1 through 3. Psalm 136, verses 1 through 3. Let's all read together. Ready? Begin. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his loving kindness is everlasting. Give thanks to the God of gods, for his loving kindness is everlasting. Give thanks to the Lord of lords, for his loving kindness is everlasting. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we give thanks and praise to you for your loving kindness is everlasting and you know what is good for us even though we may not be aware of it. Father God, help us to have the faith and the heart to be able to believe and trust in you in every situation and help us to be able to express that faith by giving thanks to you, Lord. We may be in life situation where we are unable to give thanks but God, I pray that through the word that you have given to us today and through the help of your Holy Spirit, may our lips be able to bear the fruits of thanksgiving in every situation for your glory. Father God, if there are some of us who are going through hardships or trials, may you touch their hearts so that they could trust that this is from God, that it is all for our benefit, and that you know what is best for us. And as we give thanks to you, May you give us a way out. May you give us resolution. May you get, turn our lives into blessings. May the gates of prosperity and blessings be open for each and every one of us so that we may be able to give even more thanks to you in the future. Father, we thank you so much for all of the blessings in our lives. Help us to count all of them with joy and be able to give our thanksgiving to you 
And as we are about to give this offering, may it be an expression of our heart. May our hearts go with it. And may you be glorified through this offering. We thank you. We give you all praise. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's give praise to God.